the Banshee takes a bow. The F-2H-2 Banshee is a carrier-based, single-place fighter that Navy pilots like to fly. The airplane is powered by two axial flow Westinghouse J-34 turbojet engines, each developing 3,250 pounds static thrust at sea level. With tip tanks, the wings span a hair under 45 feet. On the wings, there are launchers for eight rockets or bombs, and in the nose, four 20 millimeter forward firing guns. Normal fighter condition weight is approximately 16,750 pounds, and overload fighter condition weight is approximately 20,550 pounds. The airplane is operationally rated at speeds of 510 knots and Mach 0.85, subject to tech orders and squadron doctrine. Good ground procedure is perhaps more important in jets than in any other type of aircraft. Seconds saved idling on the ground really count in terms of airtime. The remainder of this film will show pre-flight inspection, pre-starting, starting and run-up ground procedures which are the basis of efficient and safe operation. A good way to start the pre-flight inspection is to check the Navy yellow sheet forms for discrepancies and corrective maintenance. Also check the gross weight and fuel loading. Make sure the airplane is parked against chocks so that the jet blast will do no harm and where no loose objects will be sucked into the air inlets. Duct screens should be used for all ground operation and removed prior to leaving the chocks. A thorough inspection of the exterior will take you completely around the airplane. You'll want to make sure that all wing, fuselage, and control surfaces are clean and undamaged and that the tires are free of cuts or cracks and are properly inflated. See that all covers are off and all access doors are closed and latched. While you make this general visual inspection, there are some special points to be checked on this airplane. The nose oleo strut level is checked by making sure that the indicator plate lines up properly with the flat edge area on the nose gear fork. The inlet air ducts should be uncovered, the butterfly valves open, and the inlet ducts free of loose objects. The main oleo strut spacing should be about two and a half inches. Check condition of brake pucks and check brake pins for proper extension. Check the leading edge of wings for damage. The tip tanks operate under air pressure. Check the cap for good seal. Check the tailpipe on each engine for cracks and security. Look carefully for burned, cracked, or missing turbine blades. You'll go topside to check four more points before you settle down in the cockpit. The canopy release mechanism on the turtle back is checked to be sure the stripper cam is down. On the seat catapult mechanism, see that the safety pin is in place and that the seat and track reference lines are lined up. Check the position of the pre-ejection handles on the seat. Now you are ready to inspect the cockpit. Let's take a general look around. With the exception of engine controls, you will find things pretty much as in a conventional reciprocating engine fighter. Flight instruments are grouped on the main instrument panel. On consoles to the left and right of the pilot, the throttles, control switches, and radios are mounted conventionally. Take time to make yourself comfortable. Adjust the rudder pedals for comfort. Get the parachute, the seat harness, and radio and oxygen gear settled down where you'll be relaxed. Make sure your G-suit is plugged in. In your cockpit inspection, first check the pneumatic pressure gauge reading. Your pressure should be 1,000 pounds or better. Check the oxygen supply. Turn the regulator on and test the system. Test all the flight controls through full throw. Pump the brake pedals to check brake pressure. 
The more nearly the airplane is ready to fly before you start the engines, the more time you can safely spend in the air. So pick yourself a good place to start and work right around the cockpit, making or checking the settings as you go. And as you work around, see that all electrical equipment switches are off. For example, start on the left console. See that the fuel shutoff valves are off and the auxiliary transfer switches are off. The engine master switches should be in on position and the throttles should be aft and in the off position. See that they are not in the start detent. Flaps down. Aileron boost off. Wheel handle in down position. The canopy emergency control should be in the full forward position and the armament switches off. Pull the circuit breakers on the inverter and the air compressor. On the main panel, check the clock and set altimeter to field elevation. Set the fast erector switch on the gyro to normal. A resting hook up. Yaw stabilizer off. Check battery generator switch off. Cabin temperature as desired. Wings spread and locked. Check to see that the warning posts on both wings are retracted. Finish the pre-starting routine by making sure that the inlet duct and jet blast areas are clear. When you are ready to start engines, get the signal that the auxiliary power unit is up to speed. Put the battery generator switch in the battery generator position. The plane captain gives the word that the duct doors are open and air inlets clear. Watch the tachometer as you move the throttle into the start detent. When engine speed reaches 10% RPM, turn on fuel shutoff valve for number one engine. Press the ignite switch on and hold it on while you bring the throttle forward smoothly up the curve in the detent. When the engine lights off, the tailpipe temperature will climb. When the temperature reaches 400 to 500 degrees, let the ignite switch go to off. Control the temperature with the throttle. Do not exceed 950 degrees for more than five seconds and do not exceed 850 degrees during the remainder of the time to attain idle RPM. As the engine accelerates, slowly move the throttle into the idle position. The engine should idle at 32 to 40 percent RPM with tailpipe temperatures between 580 and 625 degrees centigrade. You have just seen a successful start. Here are two things to remember. If the engine fails to start or light off within 30 seconds, return the throttle to off position, turn fuel off, and let starter cool while you proceed to start number two engine. If at any time tailpipe temperature exceeds 950 degrees centigrade, you have a hot start. The engine should be inspected for possible damage and cause of hot start. The procedure for starting the second engine is identical. Do a smooth job. The engine master switch is on. Move the throttle into start detent. At 10% RPM, turn fuel on and hold ignite switch on while you ease the throttle forward. There's the light off. Temperature climbing. Ignite switch off. Temperature a little high. Ease the throttle back. and now into idle position. With both engines idling, this airplane uses approximately 1,700 pounds of fuel per hour. So in the run-up and ground check, it pays to be both fast and accurate. Here's the procedure. APU disconnected. Check inverter normal. Push in the circuit breakers on the inverter and air compressor. Turn on the radio master switch. Test the gun sight rheostat for illumination on all three positions, gyro, gyro fixed, and fixed.
Check the fuel quantity and the low level warning light and fire warning system. Run engines up to 64% RPM. Tailpipe temperature should be from 515 degrees to 575 degrees centigrade and oil pressure from 40 to 70 PSI. Under cold starting conditions, oil pressure may reach 150 PSI. Then at 80% RPM, check the generators for parallel. The ammeters should read within 10% of each other. Turn the aileron boost switch on and check for proper operation. This completes the ground procedures on the F2H2. You have seen the pre-flight inspection, pre-starting, starting, and run-up. Understanding and practice of these procedures will help you get top performance out of this airplane. <laughs>